This week's edition of NJBIA's Minding Your Business is brought to you in part by AT&T, helping family, friends, and neighbors connect in meaningful ways every day. New Jersey's community colleges, aligning education to build an innovative workforce. Find out how your business can benefit at njpathways.org. And by New Jersey Business Magazine, providing critical information needs for New Jersey's business community for more than 66 years. Welcome to NJBI's Mind Your Business, I'm Bob Considine. Well, as legal gambling has grown in New Jersey, so too has excessive or addictive gambling in the state. And that means the Council on Compulsive Gambling of New Jersey has never been more in need. Here to discuss the latest concerns and gambling trends, as well as their very important annual conference coming up on September 20th, is CCGNJ Executive Director Felicia Grondon. Felicia, thank you so much for being here. It's really an honor that you would show up. Thank you so much for having us and yeah. for paying attention to this very important issue that is widely overlooked. Right, right. So let's talk about this. This is, uh, this is the Council on Compulsive Gambling of New Jersey. Before we get into all the issues, how long has this organization been uh, in effect and what does it do? Well, our organization was established over 40 years ago. We celebrated our uh, 40th anniversary just last year. Wow. And we started with our helpline. Okay. Uh, you, as you may know, it's called 800 Gambler. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and over the decades, we've become an authority on problem gambling in New Jersey, given our tenure uh, with regards to addressing this very important issue. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of things that we do. We're, we exist to heighten awareness about problem gambling in New Jersey. We are also um, available to help individuals and families who may be struggling with a gambling problem. We right. provide information and resources to assist them. And then we also provide training and certification opportunities for professionals, uh, for therapists, for industry professionals, um, and that's essentially what we do, generally speaking. Right, right. In addition to that, we also provide for public awareness. And one of the ways that we do that is we go and we make presentations throughout the state to faith-based groups and schools and seniors, you name it, you, we, we present it. And we talk <laughs> about gambling and problem gambling. Right. And anyone can call to request a presentation. They can visit our website and contact us. We'd be ecstatic to provide a presentation in their area. And uh, I mentioned that we cover the entire state. We train uh, clinicians in gambling addiction, as well as industry professionals about gambling addiction. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have a treatment provider network where we have um, a network of therapists trained in problem gambling. And um, I should backtrack a little bit. Mm -hmm. If an individual wishes to go to one of those therapists, right. we have a, a grant that helps them to pay for counseling. No kidding. Because a lot of people don't have money at that point yeah, in time. Yeah, right. And many insurances don't cover the cost of gambling uh, therapy. So um, that's, uh, that's, in essence, what we do at the council. Very busy, very, a lot of stuff to cover. We talk about gambling, sometimes the topic is, it, it's always buffered with, it's a hidden addiction, I guess, versus any kind of substance abuse or something like that. Can you talk about that in the challenges and kind of getting people to come forward with this issue versus, you can't necessarily tell right up front that people might have a gambling problem. Yes, it is a hidden addiction. And mm -hmm. it's hidden because unlike substance abuse, it is not, visible on an individual. There's, there weren't any physical signs. Um, in addition to that, uh, there is a stigma involved for individuals mm. that have a gambling problem. They right. are embarrassed to say that they've, lo they've lost tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. They don't share it with their family. So many are unaware that they have a problem until they hit rock bottom. Yeah. And families are unaware of, that they have a problem until Homes are lost, jobs, relationships are lost, pension funds, college funds. It's a very, very state of affairs and yeah. one that is not being adequately paid attention to. So with the onset of legalized sports betting in New Jersey, has this has, has gambling addiction become a bigger problem in New Jersey? It absolutely has. Since 2018, when Sportsbook was uh, legalized, we've experienced a 277% increase in our helpline calls. Wow. So it's quite concerning. Yeah. 
And what's even more concerning is that um, with sports betting, there are many opportunities to place wagers during the course of just one game. Right. So there's just so much opportunity yeah. on top of the fact that you only have to pick up your phone to place a call, to place a wager. Right. And, you know, it's almost like they're like, you know, it's like they don't glorify losing at all in the, in the ads that we see for sports betting. It's all very uh, sexy and like, you know, they've got top spokespeople doing this. And I don't know if people necessarily, necessarily think about the other side of this as it, as it relates to sports betting. Yes. And that's one of the major issues and concerns that we have mm-hmm. is there is this excessant advertising mm-hmm. that glamorizes gambling, as you said, uh, that expresses or implies a you can't lose right. um, you know, perspective, uh, and um, people are buying into that. But the problem is, is that people are not aware of the destruction that problem gambling can cause. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the life effects are incredible, and they not only affect the problem gambler, they affect their loved ones. Yeah. For every problem gambler, it has been said, seven individuals are affected by just one problem gambler. Yeah, you know, I, I actually saw on your website, there's a, a service called, called Gaminon. Do I have that correct? Yes, that's correct, yes. And so that helps the families too, right? That's correct. That's amazing. Um, yes. I, I'm wondering if people who are susceptible to compulsive gambling at, the, at an early age, are they surprised by it? Are they, did they say, oh my God, the uh, sports betting really sucked me in. I had no idea that it was going to be so addictive. Mm-hmm. Do you hear that at all? Um, I, I don't think we hear that directly. Mm-hmm. However, you know, younger people are into gaming. Yeah. They're on their phones. They're <laughs> playing games on phones, which are very, very similar to gambling apps. So they decide to say, or they decide to uh, place a wager, right. uh, whether they are of legal age or on occasions they have gone on to their parents' online gambling accounts right. and they have wagered on their, their accounts. Um, so uh, you know, we've seen a dramatic increase. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of it has to do with Gaming is a precursor right. to gambling. Right. It's almost like a gateway, right? Exactly. Right. It's like a it's a gateway. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So kids are getting primed as they as they uh, as they practice gaming, and mm-hmm. then they they place wagers, and uh, it's it's quite a problem. Right, uh, Felicia. I wanted to read some uh, some data from a recent survey that CCGNJ conducted with College of New Jersey. Uh, some really fascinating data points here. A little more than three quarters in the survey said that their introduction to game gambling occurred between the ages of six and 16, and a third indicated that gambling was occurring around them before the age of 11. At the same time, about six in 10 poll respondents said they currently engage in some form of betty, betting, and nearly half say they gamble at least once a week. Mm-hmm. Um, so. It's getting worse, isn't it? Yes, it is absolutely getting worse. We're getting more and more calls from younger people. In fact, recently our helpline stats have indicated that uh, individuals between the ages of 18 and 34 are the highest uh, uh, the highest demographic of callers that wow. we currently have. And there's just so many opportunities to gamble. And research has shown right. that I'm just thinking the seed gets planted early because maybe their parents are gambling as a kid. You know, you have a 12 year old kid and they see her father's like you know, betting on a football game. Then it's like, oh, I can't wait until I'm old enough to do yes. this. And they're not seeing, the father's not telling, oh, I, I just lost, <laughs> I just lost yeah. a lot of money today. And a lot of the stories that we hear are of individuals um, that went to the track with their dads. Mm. And right. they can they continued that gambling activity because it was a norm for them. It brings a warm, fuzzy feeling right. yeah. about their dad. Family and them, a right. lot of people gamble for that mm-hmm. reason, continue yeah. to gamble. And studies have shown that if you begin to gamble at an early age, you're much more likely to, to develop a gambling problem as an adult. And that's quite concerning. How about uh, funding for problem gambling in New Jersey? Where are we at with that compared to other states? Well, New Jersey uh, ranks third in the nation with regards to gross gaming revenue mm-hmm. that is generated as a result of our uh, gambling industry. Right. But we dropped to 19 in the country when it comes to funding for problem gambling treatment and prevention. Wow. Uh, we are grateful for the, uh, the support that we get from the state of New Jersey. Right. Uh, but we only receive 
less than 1% of the revenue that is collected. Okay. Only less than 1% wow. of the revenue that is collected goes to the council. Uh, and we do a lot of great things at yeah, the council. I can tell. You guys are we busy. Do. Um, how about, are there any legislative uh, efforts out there, whether state or federal, to kind of help bring more funding to this uh, issue? Well, unfortunately, there's no federal funding for problem gambling at wow. this point in time. Okay. There is a piece of legislation that's been introduced uh, to Congress called the GRIT Act uh, that would provide for some funding, right. uh, which which the National Council on Problem Gambling is is advocating for. We are members of the of the National Council on Problem Gambling, and I recently became a board member for the council. Thank you so right, much. Right. I'm honored to be for New Jersey to have a seat at the table. Yeah, we saw that news. That yeah, great. so it was just great news. Uh, with regards to um, funding on the state level, um, we have been meeting with the legislature. We've had a very active legislative uh, outreach. Good. Uh, there have been a number of issues that we wish to have addressed. One is we would like to have warning labels on brick and mortar casino sites mm. and on online gambling sites akin to the Surgeon General's warning on tobacco products. Right. People should be warned that this is a risky behavior. Yeah. Uh, Senator uh, McKeon has introduced a piece of legislation to address that issue. Mm. Another issue is our desire to have a public service announcement to warn people about the risks of gambling. Right. You don't see any of that. Everything is glamorized. Yeah, right. Senator McKeon has also introduced a piece of legislation to address that issue. Um, we need to have public service announcements. People need to be educated. They are not being educated at this point in time. Right. Yeah. Um, and you find out it's too late sometimes, right? Absolutely. Most of the time, it is too late when they find out that they have a problem. Everything is lost at that point in time. Felicia, what does recovery look like for uh, addicted gamblers? What is it? No more gambling? Is it just as simple as that? Is it cutting back? Is it recovering, uh, even uh, psychologically? What was involved for in recovery? For someone to recover and remain in recovery. Yep abstinence that's it Just that you know simple. the the problem gambler it's very difficult for the problem gambler to stop mm -hmm. you know when people gamble they experience many people it's exciting they experience a dopamine rush right. uh, they're going <laughs> after that yeah. um, and for a problem gambler that's very very difficult to do yeah. and responsible gambling is not pertinent to the problem gambler yeah. it's a good way uh, to prevent um, a gambling problem from occurring by setting money limits and time limits, it's right. a good idea, right. but it really isn't an effective tool for a problem gambler. Mm -hmm. It's a preventative mechanism. Yeah, and I think people don't necessarily, I, I think people might think, well, you can lose your house or your job, but, but some people actually do harm to themselves from this, correct? Absolutely. A, a problem gambling has the highest rate of suicide ideation amongst any addiction, has a 20% suicide ideation wow. rate. And uh, it's it's quite scary. It's it, and I don't think the public. I know the public doesn't recognize the severity of this problem, and right. it's because it's not being brought to the forefront to the degree to which it should be. Right. So you have a form to bring more uh, attention to it. I mentioned at the introduction, uh, CCGNJ is hosting its annual conference at the New Jersey Hospital Association headquarters in Princeton on September twentieth, and the title of the conference is "Confronting the Surge in Problem Gambling." So Felicia, why should people attend this conference? Well, they can learn a lot about uh, individuals in recovery because we do have a panel discussion on uh, an individual who went through recovery. Really? Uh, we have a uh, segment that focuses on unethical practice, practices that sports gaming operators uh, institute to get people to play. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there's a, a wonderful, uh, there's another uh, segment that focuses on financial harms having to do with uh, with gambling. Right. So it's it's a good mix of therapists and regulators um, and just interested individuals, people that are in recovery. Right. It's a wonderful conference. It's an all day conference, and um, we're just grateful that we are able to educate the public to some degree yeah. uh, through our conference efforts. All right, well, this has been great information. For more information or to register for the event, you're going to visit 800gambler.org, and all the information will be there. Felicia Grandin, this is great work. Continue the fight, and thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having us. We truly appreciate it. You're welcome. And we'll be back right after these words. Calm before the storm? No, thank you. This is Jim's time to shine.
and mics and Jennifer's. Helmets, check. Drones, check. Checking that thing we just checked, double check. We ain't got time to chill. We're out here driving this thing. This is when we get to work to keep you connected no matter what. Connect before the storm. Change how we weather them. Connecting changes everything. AT&T. Welcome back to NJBI's Mind Your Business. I'm Bob Considine. Well, recently, a coalition of legislators on both sides of the aisle, union workers, energy producers, and business leaders, held a rally to call upon the federal EPA and the State Department of Environmental Protection to steer clear of electric vehicle mandates that they say are unattainable and will negatively impact New Jersey's economy. We now take you outside the New Jersey State House to hear why they all said that state and federal government should immediately reverse course on an EV ban. The governor has embraced the California Air Resources Board, or CARB, mandates, which call for New Jersey to be a 100% EV marketplace by 2035. But just last month, he approved a $1,060 upfront fee on the purchase of all new EVs sold in New Jersey effective July 1st. And his Board of Public Utilities has slashed the cash on the hood incentives they offered from $4,000 to $2,000. And on top of all that, the governor's FY25 budget calls for a phase out of the sales tax exemption on electric vehicles, which has literally been the only consistent and the most powerful incentive dealers have had in the showroom to sell EVs. All in, these policies will add thousands of dollars to the purchase price of a new EV. Please tell me how that's going to help move the market. Let's face it, New Jersey will be a 100% EV market when consumers say so not when government mandates it. The car dealers that we represent in the state uh, are uh, ready, willing, and able uh, to work with this administration, but it's time that this administration put money, uh, state money, where its mandates are and make meaningful investments in the infrastructure and incentives needed to move the EV market. And if the state can't afford to follow the CARB rules, which appears to be the case at this point, then the administration should acknowledge its mandates are unrealistic and walk away like the governors of Maine, Connecticut, and Virginia have already done. Even if we had a magic wand and cost wasn't an issue and we deployed all of the charging stations necessary tomorrow, we don't have the energy to support it, to meet the demand. And while at the same time we're racing towards mandated electrification across all sectors, we've blocked natural gas expansion projects to the tune of $15 billion. Now that $15 billion is not only lost jobs for men and women like I represent, huge economic losses for the state, but it also represents a missed opportunity to significantly reduce energy costs for all New Jersey customers and reduce emissions. So we're taxing our grid with this proposal. We've blocked projects that would help us diversify that and strengthen that energy portfolio. And we haven't even mentioned that these mandates put the only constitutionally dedicated revenue to support our transportation trust fund in severe jeopardy. Without that dedicated funding that is responsible for statewide transportation improvements, but also hundreds of millions of dollars a year in local aid, means that either our roads and bridges will crumble and not be maintained, or we'll have to make up those funds with local property taxes, something we know New Jerseyans can't bear. These regulations threaten jobs in the traditional automotive manufacturing and maintenance across our state, whereby they will cause significant hardship to workers. The cost burden, electric vehicles, EVs, are currently more expensive than gasoline counterparts. Increased taxes and electricity bills will further add strain to our working families. Then there's the California example. You gotta like this one, you're gonna love this one. California has recently proposed a six month pilot program and we all know how this is gonna turn out. It begins this August and will involve volunteers split into two groups. One group will be charged a flat rate of 2.8 cents per mile as a, as a revenue neutral rate. This amount will supposedly bring in the same amount as their current gas tax, and, other, and another group will be taxed based on their vehicle's fuel efficiency. This rate is supposed to decrease as fuel efficiency increases. Well, we know where this will end up, and that is the amount will just increase over time as legislators of this program did not speci specify a rate cap. Therefore, we need to be mindful that there's a negative environmental, environmental component 
with uh, electric cars. While reducing greenhouse gases is important, the manufacturing process of EVs emits substantial greenhouse gases through mining, refining, and manufacturing. We need realistic assessments of the environmental, Im environmental impacts associated with all vehicle types. Why are we allowing a technocratic bureaucracy that regularly leaves its own state in a series of brownouts to dictate policy for a whole nation? California has proven it can't govern, but yet the EPA and other states want to model their foolish ideas? It just doesn't make sense. But the impacts aren't just local, they're global. China dominates the global supply chain for EVs, batteries, and minerals. Any policy mandating electric vehicle adoption and cutting off consumer access to new gas-powered cars jeopardizes U.S. energy security to China's advantage. It's been reported that 95% of the necessary silicon needed for alternative energy stems from the Xinjiang internment camps. Moreover, the cobalt needed for EV batteries comes at a high human cost. It's been reported that more than 2 thousand people die a year in the mines of Congo while also facing exploitation and child slave labor. But we're going to rely on these inputs at a higher environmental, social, and geopolitical cost? For all of the differences between Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, even business and labor, we should all agree to this. No American should have to compete with slave labor. And no American consumer should be forced to buy a product made with slave-made goods in the U.S. marketplace. Should the government mandate you to buy anything? No. Should they mandate you to buy electric cars? No. Should they mandate you buy gas cars? No. That being said, I agree with all of you. The answer is no. We believe in freedom of choice. The free market is what made cars a viable transportation option in the first place. In fact, the only thing the government has any responsibility with our cars is to make sure, ensure that they are roadworthy. They pa your cars pass inspection, they go on the road, and there's plenty of police out there to ensure that you're passing, you're not violating any local speed laws. We're all familiar with that. I do not believe that there's anything wrong with electric vehicles, but I do believe they should pass the free market test. If they're good for you, make your free choice, go out and buy one. If it makes sense for you to drive a gas car, be it a, uh, a little hybrid, an SUV, a pickup truck, go out and buy one. Your needs are yours alone and should not be up to the whims of bureaucrats in Trenton. With an EV mandate, there will be too many unknowns for low and moderate income New Jerseyans, for seniors, many in my district, for, and also young people for families struggling to make ends meet. Clearly, we do not have the roadside infrastructure or grid power to allow most drivers to have an electric vehicle. And we don't have a local on the street and in the driveway infrastructure for everyone to have one. This proposed federal mandate, as well as New Jersey's EV rule, acknowledges that there will be those who will not own cars. Solutions being offered to those folks are programs to promote EV buses, rideshare alternatives, or even bicycle ownership. For many residents who depend on their cars to get to work, shop, vacation, or see their doctors, these are not realistic solutions. The EV mandate conversation is one about reality versus fantasy. In no real world can we eliminate gas and diesel powered cars in the next 10 years. In no real world could we eliminate good consumer sentiment millions of people have towards their gas cars. Nor should we want to. In this administration's fantasy world, we will all willingly choose EVs and our infrastructure will be ready to support all of the new charging stations. Our grid won't buckle, our wallets won't be thinned out due to elevated cost of EVs, and no one will ever experience range of anxiety with their new car. But we all know that's not reality. Last year, gas cars accounted for 84% of U.S. vehicle sales, and I strongly believe that our country is simply not at a point where we can roll out an EV mandate that is widespread as the one put forth by the EPA. I have spoken to constituents in my district who have concerns about the affordability of electric vehicles and concerns from auto retailers with concerns with enough supply to meet the demand. Additionally, as we stand here today, we do not have anywhere near enough of an infrastructure to charge a massive influx of EVs to the market. I am proud to be here to raise concerns and be a voice in our state house that will advocate for sensible changes that will help all New Jerseyans. 
it is important that we find the balance between protecting our environment and mandates that will not be sustainable in the future. There is a way for us to transition to clean energy, but we should incentivize it. And I'm just going to give a little context. I served as a member of a Board of Education on Council, and we did a joint solar initiative with our municipality, with our school district, with our utility authority, and we also did major improvements to upgrade our facilities to make them more energy improvement, to make them more energy efficient. Do you want to know how we did that? State incentives. We should be incentivizing, not mandating people to go to electric vehicles. Our grid is dependent. When we talk about our energy sources, it has to be hydrogen. It has to be solar. It has to be gas. It has to be nuclear. We need an energy portfolio that, that will be able to support our grid and the investment when we talk about the creation of jobs, when we talk about people being able to afford it. So I think you'll see here that you have a bipartisan coalition of legislators because we know the impact that this will have on middle and working class New Jersey families. And I'm proud to stand here. I'm proud to support you. And I'm proud to support our workers. Thank you. Mandating what we can or cannot buy in the automotive market is nothing any government should be partaking in. And I, for one, will not be partaking in it because it's just not an American idea. What we see happening around the world with, with alternative power, wind power, and things of that nature, a perfect example is, and you guys can check this for yourselves, in the Republic of Germany, 28% of their electrical generation comes from wind farms. They have invested a massive amount of money of their GDP in building wind farms to the tune of 28%. That's a lot of electrical energy from a wind farm. Their kilowatt hour rate is four and a half times our rate. Imagine your electric bills being four and a half times bigger than they are right now. This is a bad idea, guys. A very bad idea. And I can tell you from my part in my caucus, we're going to talk very strongly against this. And like I said when I started, the fact that this is bipartisan is a big deal. And I thank my friends from the other side of the aisle for coming here today and having the courage to say this is a bad idea. We poll the whole country. You know, 70% of people in this country have no idea about these regulations. None. And when they find out about it, overwhelmingly they're opposed. In Michigan, we saw in the other day, 87% of all people in Michigan oppose. Nationwide, it's 75%. 60% of Democrats oppose. 80% of independents oppose. The country does not want this. We're here to make sure people hear you. We appreciate everything you do. Know that when we go back to Washington, we're going to fight for the people here today. We're going, to, we're going to fight for your jobs, and we're going to fight for our cars and your choice. So I ask you, please, go to don'tbanourcars.com. Find out how you can get involved. Light these phone booths up, these phone lines. Light them up every day. Light up uh, the White House. We can give you, go to that website, and you can get information how to do it. When you leave today, this is just a little something. You got out of work today, some of you. You're here. It's the right place to be. It's your state capitol. When you go home, you've got to talk to your coworkers and you've got to get them engaged. We are very distracted people at the moment. I mean, how can you not be distracted? We've got a major soap opera going on. Presidential race coming on. It's Jerry Springer season 17. <laughs> but we have to be careful because those distractions will cause us to take our eye off the ball. And these kinds of things will happen. And remember, those who are suggesting this, they're not evil or bad people. They're largely in rooms, they're largely academic, and they're just not in touch. We have to help them better understand. We're not against, we're part of the solution. Got to be smart. Raise your voices, talk to your assembly people, talk to your, talk to your senators in a rational, straightforward way and factual. We will win this on the merits. We don't have to be emotional, but we cannot be weak and got to speak up. So to all of you who came today, a big thank you. This is worth fighting for, and the, and the process here in Trenton is accepting of its citizens' voices. Talk to us, and do it in a way that gets our attention. Don't have to be mean. Just say, hey, fellas, like, doesn't work, and doesn't work for a lot of reasons. So go home, go to work, feed your families, but get engaged. That's how we win. Thank you, everybody. All right, thank you to all the attendees of the State House EV Rally. Thanks to producer Vinny Civitillo for documenting it. And thank you for joining us on NJBI is Minding Your Business. We'll see you next time.